took place. All right, so um, I think that those questions that were just asked were a pretty good segue into this presentation. So which is titled, um, Using ChatGPT with Confidence for Biodiversity Related Information Tasks. Um, next slide. And I thank the earlier presenters for explaining what ChatGPT is and does. So I'll get right into it. So I asked ChatGPT, and again, GPT 3.5 as before, it's cheap. Um, what plant species can I find in Gainesville, Florida, where I'm from? And it gave this big long reply and it includes a list of species that are identified by their common names and their scientific names. And then it gives a little description of each of the species um, and their interactions with the, the local area. And I wanted to wonder, I wondered, can ChatGPT give this to me in a more machine readable format so that I can use it for downstream analysis? Next slide. So I asked it to reformat the list in TSV or tab separated values, just a common spreadsheet format using Darwin core terms, where of course Darwin core gives us a language for describing species occurrences. And it did exactly that. So the first line in its response, um, it decided to use the terms scientific name, vernacular name and location. And these are Darwin core terms. I didn't provide it with this information. And then it gave me a list of every single species by its scientific name, vernacular name, and location that it mentioned in its previous response. Next slide. Thanks. So this makes us wonder, can we actually mine large language models like ChatGPT for biodiversity data or for whatever information that they have stored in their memory? And the reason that ChatGPT and other models can answer these questions is because they're trained on essentially all of the internet, um, as much text as they possibly can get. And this includes a lot of scientific and non-scientific sources. And it also includes a lot of biodiversity information, apparently, because it was able to answer my question. And the reason why this is kind of exciting is because, well, it's fine, you can, <laughs> it's exciting is because um, not all of the information, I, I assume, I think it's safe to say that not all the information that ChatGPT knows, ChatGPT knows is available in curated data sets. So there's a gap between our curated data sets and the information that's contained in all the text on the internet. So can LLMs help fill this gap? And to clarify, this is not to replace curated data sets, but it's to say, can we get at least some kind of data when we don't have data for the whatever answer we're trying to question or question we're trying to answer? But there's a problem, as the um, earlier question stated, that LLMs sometimes make up information, and this is called hallucination. So how do we know when to trust them? Next. Our proposed solution is to first evaluate an LLM's performance on a test set and then train a confidence model to detect and discard any mistakes that we think it makes. Next slide. Um, if you didn't guess already, our, our specific application that we attempted to solve is, or to implement, is to use ChatGPT to predict species occurrences with high confidence. Next. More precisely, um, given a species and location, we want ChatGPT to say whether the species is present or absent at that location. Next. And this can be phrased as a yes or no question. So there's just a screenshot I asked, does Macropus rufus naturally occur in Gainesville, Florida? And ChatGPT can say yes or no. And thankfully it said no. Next. Um, to make this a little bit more actionable at a larger scale, Instead of typing questions into JetGPT manually, we use their web API. Next slide. The first step that we did um, of three steps was to compile a labeled test data set. So we needed a reference point where we can say whether ChatGPT is right or wrong for um, a reference set. So we collected a bunch of species records using IDigBio. And we tried to sample records somewhat evenly across the three kingdoms, um, plantae, animalia, and, and fungi. And we ended up with about 10,000 records after doing some cleaning and, and filtering. And these 10,000 records come from all phyla available on Attic Bio for those three kingdoms. And the chart kind of exploded, but the <laughs> it's supposed to show um, the, the distribution uh, across the three kingdoms of the records that we sampled. So the blue, it's over there. 
Oh, it's there, but the, the labels are not what they should be. Um, <laughs> the, the blue um, says that about half the records, almost half the records we have are plants. The orange is animals, so about a third of the records. And then the gray is fungi, which was about 20%. Next, please. There's a problem though with this in and that is that Eidigbau's records are largely presence only. They only describe where species are, but not where they are not for the most part. So, but we, we, we needed to have species absence in order to be able to say whether ChatGPT is actually right or if it's just saying yes all the time. So we made a synthetic data set of pseudo absences. Um, and we did this by taking all 10,000 records that we had and just randomizing their locations. Assuming that if we pick a random location, there's a decent chance that the species doesn't actually exist there, at least not to known records or curated records. Um, and so we did that. And then we looked at all of the locations we came up with and we removed any that were found in IDIC bio, any species location pairs that we did find in IDIC bio. And that was only about 8%. So we ended up with about 9,000 of these pseudo absences. Next slide. The second step was to turn this test set into questions and submit them to ChatGPT and grade its responses. And so ChatGPT needs natural language inputs or prompts in order to do whatever you want it to do. So we took the record. So there's an example on the left, just a subset of a record. We have a scientific name and then some location information consisting of a country, state, province, and county. And we turn this into a question. So does the species naturally occur at this location? Yes or no. Next. We submit this question to JetGPT. Um, if it says yes for a presence record, it's correct. If it says no for an absence record, it's correct. And then any other responses, because it's not always well behaved, it doesn't always want to say yes or no. Um, we interpret them as it's saying it doesn't know whether it's yes or no. Next, please. And the third step was once we have all this labeled information about whether it was correct or wrong in its responses, we trained a confidence model to try to predict future um, cases where its responses might be correct or incorrect. The, we define a confidence model as something that assigns confidence scores to each response, where a confidence score is a probability that the response is correct. Next, please. But what information can we actually use to make that prediction? Um, or in other words, what do we feed to our confidence model as inputs? Next. So for each question, we currently have a scientific name, a location the, that make up the question, and then we have the model's response, which is usually one word, yes, no, or I don't know. Next. And this isn't enough information. I regret making animations. Um, but next, please. <laughs> so we need more uncertainty information. Next. So now we want to um, gather uncertainty information and train a confidence model. So the first approach that we took was to repeat each question 10 times. Um, as we've said before, ChatGPT is not necessarily deterministic, and this goes for most language models. So it can give you a different response every time you ask it something. So our intuition was that if it responds the same answer every single time, then it's pretty certain in its result. If it, re if it changes its answer as you ask it, then it might be uncertain in its result. Next. Next. A second approach was to ask each question in different ways. So language models can be sensitive to the phrasing um, of the inputs, even if they're semantic, they mean the same thing. So for example, can species be found in location might give you a yes answer. But then if we ask, is there a presence of species within location, it might change its answer. Next, please. Um, the a third approach was to test chat GPT or, or any LLM on related questions about a species to, to ask it, does it know the subject matter that we're asking it about? Um, for example, we compiled a, a separate data set about taxonomy information using the GBIF backbone. Um, and we, we asked it, for example, for each species, can chat GPT guess what its genus, family, order, phylum, all that stuff is? Next, please. And just hit next a bunch of times until you see some red text. <laughs> um, the one more. Thank you. And the the point is that you can come up with any number of methods. Um, the what, what we try to do is just come up with as many methods as possible that could give us information that might be correlated and therefore predictive of ChatGPT's performance. Next. So our implementation next. 
<laughs> we came up with 20 uncertainty measures. Um, they're not all totally unique. Some of them are kind of derivative of each other. Um, but to collect these 20 uncertainty measures, uh, we had to run and we had to collect about 70 chat GPT responses <laughs> per question. Um, that's, that's a lot less than it sounds. Um, I mean, it, it's not as expensive as it sounds. And then we, we also pulled in some external information, for example, from IDIC Bio and other test data sets. Next. Our implementation for the model is to use XGBoost with isotonic regression. And that's not really important what, why we chose those, but the important thing is that we have a constraint where any increase in our uncertainty inputs should not increase confidence. Next, please. And we used about 50% of our questions for training and 50% for testing. Next. <laughs> And here are our results. So I'm presenting them in terms of precision recall graphs, which take a little bit of explaining, but I'll try my best. So each point on the graph represents a confidence threshold where all ChatGPT's responses above the threshold we consider trusted and below the threshold we, we ignore. Um, next, three times. <laughs> and the X axis here is recall, which represents the percentage of responses that are considered with with that exceed the confidence threshold or the, the percentage of correct responses that exceed the confidence threshold so for example at the very right side of the of the graph you can see um if we have 100 percent recall which means we trust everything um we have a certain accuracy which is the, the vertical that dotted line um so if we trust everything we only got about like 63 percent accuracy which isn't even that much better than a coin flip. So it's not a great <laughs> not a great thing to do. But as we increase our, or decrease our recall, we increase in precision. And what precision is, is of the responses that you trust, what percentage are actually correct? So as you discard things that you might be mistakes, um, your accuracy increases. So next, a couple times. So if we decrease recall down to 37%, we can get up to 80% precision, for example. Um, now the left one is for animals, um, the right one is for plants. So some uh, performance is pretty similar across those two. Next, please. Um, that's an editing mistake. Next, please. <laughs> uh, one more. All right, so now on the right, we have fungi and performance wasn't so good for that. I looked at the data and there is a lot of issues with like just inconsistent um, inputs, like, like th for example, for like the genus, I might say unknown and stuff like that. Um, so there's, there's a lot of reasons why the performance might not be as good as it is. Um, someone else might know better why. <laughs> Next, please. So for, the, for these examples, um, we trained our confidence model on all of the responses, all of our test set. Um, next. But if we only train it on a subset, for example, only on questions about plants, we can see that the model actually generalizes. So on the right, I trained the model only on the plant data, and then I tested it on animal data, and performance was pretty similar. We only lost about 3% precision at the same recall. Next, please. So conclusions, you can hit next like three times. <laughs> Um, so first of all, it's, it, we were kind of surprised to see that we can make a really simple model with only hundreds of parameters. That's our confidence model. And it can detect mistakes made by extremely complex models. For example, ChatGPT has, their 3.5 has about 175 billion parameters, which is really big. Um, and of course, I should clarify that mis by mistakes, we mean using iDigBio as a trusted source. And iDigBio does contain mistakes. But here, we're just going ahead and, and trusting everything that I said. Um, and second of all, we can increase the reliability of the LLMs that we use um, by discarding low confidence responses. Of course, this comes at the cost of getting less um, responses from it. And third of all, the, the, the point of all this is to say that for biodiversity related problems, if we can pose them as sets of yes and no questions, which is very simple binary problems, we can actually use LLMs with higher reliability than we might normally get if we just trusted everything. Next, please. And thanks for listening. I also wanted to um, acknowledge IDIG Bio for supporting me and also the ACES lab where I work at the University of Florida. Um, thank you. Um, I think 
Uh, we are kind of over time. Maybe if someone has one question. Uh, okay, all right. Well then, thank you to all the speakers. Um, this session is going to continue uh, tomorrow at 4.30 in this room, and then there's another session on Thursday as well. Um, yes, thanks to all the speakers. Have a nice evening, everyone.